Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. This is the podcast that tackles tough questions about relationships, life, love, and loss. It may not be the advice you want, but it's probably the advice you need. And now here's your host, grief therapist, motivational speaker, relationship expert, best-selling author, and attorney, the not really mean, mean lady herself, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Susan Elliott, host of Mean Lady Talking Podcast. And I want to go back to the first episode in season two when I was talking about dating. I was talking about the fact that there was a lack of explanation when I left that relationship. As I said before, without without big blow up, restraining orders, all kinds of drama going on, I was in such chaotic relationships through my teens and then I was in a chaotic marriage through my 20s. So I didn't really know how to end relationships. But even years later, when I found the words, at the beginning, I didn't know what the words were. But even later, when I found out what the words were, there are certain things that is just not worth arguing over, not worth saying to somebody, oh, we have this disagreement. There are certain things that point out that there is such a gulf. You cannot cross it. It will not work. Another example that I like to give is that I had been in a relationship with somebody. I brought a cat to the relationship. He brought a cat to the relationship. I brought my dog Max. And when Max passed, we each got puppies. He got a Dobie puppy because he just fell in love with Dobies. And I believe to this day, He's only had Dobies. He just fell in love with my dog, Max, and he's had Dobies. I've talked to him after he moved to the West Coast, and even on the West Coast, he was telling me that he had Dobies. So he had Dobies, and I had gotten a rescue pup, and she was a white shepherd mixed with something else, but she looked like a small white shepherd, and she had traces of blonde hair on the back. She wasn't totally white. She was more like blonde. And she was so tough. She was the alpha dog. So I named her Cagney after the character Christine Cagney on Cagney and Lacey because she was a tough blonde. And I was like, that's my Cagney. We called her Cagney Wagony. And we had so much fun with those dogs. But when I left, we tried doggy visitation and it didn't work. And I've told people that in the past. My vet said it doesn't work. It's very traumatic on the dog. She was happy to see me. If you have a dog and you've owned them and for some reason you have to give them away, they never forget you. If you treated them right and they loved you and cared about you, they'll never forget you. They'll always be happy when you show up. But that doesn't mean that that disruption in their order is good for them. And I know that that's not always a popular opinion, and I've even talked to some supposed experts that think that it's okay, but I don't think it's okay. I think that the dog gets very stressed out. So after a while, I decided to end the puppy visitation. I didn't think it was good for her. And she was so much better off with them. I couldn't imagine separating those two dogs. They were so dependent on each other. And my ex told me that when she was gone, his dog was mourning and moping. And he didn't say it to me to manipulate it. He was just saying, oh, he, you know, he missed Cagney Wagney. And I said, I know, I think she missed you guys too. And I had taken her for walks. I mean, she, she seemed happy and healthy. I didn't think she missed anybody, but I know that dogs are pack animals. They like to be in their pack and they like everything to be very predictable and orderly. So anyway, while I was still living in that house, we were separate. He was living in the basement. I was living in the master bedroom because we had decided to end the relationship. The breakup was somewhat amicable. He still got up with the boys in the morning because I was working all day, going to school all night. And sometimes I didn't get home till three, four o'clock in the morning. And I've always been an insomniac. So even when I wasn't going to school, if I was up because I couldn't sleep until four or five, When the boys got up at seven, my ex, who was my present at the time, even when he was my ex, he would get up and give them breakfast, which was nice. And we wanted the kids to have an orderly existence as far as we could. We didn't talk to them 
in detail about the separation. We tried to get them used to the idea that we were going to be separating in January when I graduated from grad school. So we were together about four months. And in that four months, I started dating a friend of mine from graduate school. And these are two things I would never do again. I would never date somebody that I went to graduate school with or a school or, you know, whatever. I would try not to ever have to live with an ex. And these were all things that I came up with at that time. In all my other relationships, I had waited months, sometimes even a year before I started seeing other people. But the relationship that I was in had been falling apart almost the entire time that I was in grad school. And I can and I can't blame it on grad school. There were different things that were going on. It wasn't grad school, but it just happened to happen while I was in grad school. And I started, I was really hurt and I started dating my friend. He and I were talking about me moving out and I said, I need to find a place where I could have kids because my kids were in junior high at the time. And I was like, I need to stay in the same town and a place that has pets. And he says, oh, you're not taking your dog and cat, are you? And I said, well, I'm taking my cat. I'm going to have puppy visitation with the dog. And this was before I had actually tried puppy visitation. And he said, I'm allergic to animals. And I said, well, there's shots for that. There's allergy shots for that. And dog wasn't coming overnight. So I said, I won't let the cat sleep in the bedroom. My cat was an indoor outdoor cat. I think I've talked about my cat before. He took off when he was about six months old. I lived in the city. We opened the door one day. We lived on the second floor in the city. And that cat found a way out. I got him at six weeks old and he had his mother and his siblings. They had been indoor outdoor cats. When I got him, he was in the backyard. I was looking at the kittens and a friend of mine had brought me over there and said, because I kept saying there's a certain kit, there's a certain type of cat that I want. And he said, okay, I'll bring you a friend of mine's, friend of mine's cat just had kittens. I'll bring you over there. You can interview a few. So I did. I went over and this cat walked out and the two cats that I was looking at, they were two playing on the grass together. And I'm looking at the kittens and I was like, I don't know. I was kind of feeling lukewarm about them. And then Around the corner struts this cat. I was like, oh my goodness, this cat knows who he is. He was like six weeks old and he's strutting. And I said, oh my goodness, he has the Walt Frazier strut. Walt Frazier used to bring the basketball down the court in just Mr. Cool fashion. Mr. Cool, um, amazing. And when this cat walked out, I was like, oh my goodness, this is like Clyde Frazier bringing the ball down the court. And that was his name, Clyde. And I scooped him up and brought him home and he walked was the coolest cat ever. He never lost his coolness. Not from that day until when he passed away when he was about 16, 17. I was with Michael when Clyde passed away and I had him since my youngest was a year old and he was in high school when Clyde passed. So Clyde was about 16 or 17. But he got out at six months old into the city and I was like, that's it. He's gone. I'll ne- he'll never come back. We're on the second floor. We, we had a tendency to lock all the doors because we were in sort of a sketchy neighborhood. But within a few hours, he comes home. Every place I lived, he did exactly the same thing. Whether I lived in the city, the country, the suburbs, part country, part suburbs, part city, part suburb, he would get out and he would come back in. When I lived in that house with uh, that boyfriend and the two dogs and my boyfriend's cat, the, the two cats fought for, they were both pretty mellow cats with other cats. They fought for like 24 hours. We, we let them go in this house that I was renting. We all shut the bedroom doors and they basically worked it out overnight. You could hear the cats growling and... <laughs> attacking each other and after that they were fine and both of us had acclimated cats to each other in the past so we just let them go they were very mellow cats and I actually have a picture of them laying side by side on top of the refrigerator and they were both like peer down at you like little gargoyles on top of the refrigerator but Clyde was the coolest cat and he was a serial killer there were bodies all over my lawn he was out all summer long because he would just kill everything and I had moles and I had rabbits and I had voles and I had mice and I had birds and I had all kinds of things. I had animals I couldn't even 
identify on my I need a CSI in my backyard. So anyway, that's Claude. And I'm thinking and then he would come in and he would jump up on my lap and he would throw his head back like he was a baby in my arms and then and he would sleep like that for hours and he would like to curl up on the dining room chair and when Max would come along when Max was alive he would come along and he would just push the cat with his nose and Clyde completely asleep with his eyes still closed would grab Max's snout with his claws Max always had these little red dots on his snout because the Clyde would just be like leave me alone so that's Clyde I want to give you this build up for Clyde for this conversation that I'm about to have with my soon to be ex-boyfriend so we move into the house and we we move in the first weekend that my kids go to their fathers because I didn't bring any boyfriends around my kids the guy that I lived with was the only one and between him and Michael I didn't bring my kids around any guys that I dated I just did not believe in it and I think my kids met one other guy that I ever dated, but I was just one of these people. I was very adamant that men didn't know where I lived. I always met them places. And even if I was in a relationship with somebody, I did not let them meet my kids. This particular boyfriend met my kids when we graduated, but he didn't meet them as a boyfriend. He met them as a friend, a classmate, somebody who was graduating. We had dinner together and that was a cluster, but I'll get into that some other time. So I invite him over the house. This is after we graduate. And the kids have gone to their father's for the weekend. And he sees a cat bowl in the kitchen. I graduated in January. I moved out the end of January. So this is probably February. So Clyde's in. If it was wintertime, he'd go out for a little bit. And in the summer, he'd go out all the time. I didn't even have to keep a litter box in the house during the summer. So he comes in and he, he sees a water bowl on the kitchen floor. And he says... You brought the cat? And I said, yes, of course I brought the cat. Why wouldn't I bring the cat? And he said, I told you I was allergic. And I said, yeah, I told you there's shots for that. And I said, I'm not going to let him in my bedroom, but I had a pullout couch in my office downstairs. I am going to sleep in the basement. with. When you're not here, I'm going to sleep in the basement with the cat because he sleeps with me almost every night. I'm not going to let him in the bedroom. And, and the rest of the house is spotless. It's clean. There's no cat hair around or anything like that. And I said, Clyde will go in the basement. That's where his litter box is. That's where I hang out when you're not here. It's in the office downstairs. So he's going to be in the office. He's not going to be upstairs. He brought up me getting rid of the cat like two more times. And even though he was there for the whole weekend, I didn't see him sneeze once. I didn't see any watery eyes, nothing. And I started to think, you know what? I cannot be in a relationship with somebody who would expect me to give up my cat. The gulf is too wide. And I... I thought that he was a nice guy when we were friends, but we had a very encapsulated friendship. It was all about school. Both very high on school. We were both very excited about school. We took the same classes together. We were always talking school. That was it. That was what that relationship was based upon. We had gone away for Thanksgiving. And when I got to his house, again, this is like the cheap thing. When I got to his house, this is years after I decided that I was going to date people that were willing to spend money on me. And that's something that I've addressed in other podcasts. So I'm not going to go into that. But we had agreed that we were going to go away for Thanksgiving weekend. I didn't have my kids. I always had a hard time on holidays when I didn't have my kids. And I had given up my Thanksgivings with them because I had them for Christmas and New Year's. New Year's Eve, we used to watch the Stooges. Christmas, I wanted my kids in their own house. And so I gave up my Thanksgiving so that I could have my kids for Christmas and New Year's. But I always had a tough time on Thanksgiving. So he said to me, I don't have my kids. You don't have your kids. Uh, Why don't we go away for Thanksgiving? So I looked down the Cape. On Cape Cod, they have all kinds of awesome winter values. So we found this townhouse that was this incredible, incredible value for the wintertime. It had jacuzzi suites. They were townhomes. We had a, a bed in a loft and a bedroom downstairs. I mean, it could have had like 10 people over in this townhouse that we rented. The morning that I got to his apartment, now I had put everything on my charge card and we were going to have dinner at the Kunamasset Inn, which is an historical inn on Cape Cod. And I had this most awesome weekend. And I was the first Thanksgiving weekend that I could remember that I didn't 
miss my kids when I got to his place on Thursday morning. And we have reservations at the Kunamasset Inn for that night. And I have paid for the whole weekend at this townhouse. We were leaving Sunday morning because I had to pick up the kids Sunday night. He gets there and he goes, I can't go. And I said, what do you mean you can't go? And he said, oh, I had to pay all my bills. He he was on this plan where I guess he didn't have good credit. And I find this all out after I've known this guy like a year and a half. None of this stuff came up when we were friends. Of course, there was no opportunity for it to come up. So I want you to think about that when you're dating. I want you to think about there are certain situations that you're not going to come up against until later on when you really know each other so you have to know even if I know this person six months to a year there might be a deal breaker in there that's going to come up and I'm going to have to go I said to him well if we don't go on this vacation I'm losing all this money and I'm going to lose I had already paid because it was a fixed price meal for Thanksgiving at the Kunamasa Inn I said I'm going to lose the money on the townhouse and then and the and I'm going to lose the money on dinner. I have to go. So we, when he goes, well, I just want to let you know, you know, I didn't have any money. What he was, what he was involved in was he had consolidated all of his credit cards. So he had to pay one lump sum to some company that negotiated down his credit card, something like that. But if you find something out like that and For me, it was a yield sign. It wasn't a stop sign, but it was a yield sign. It should have been a stop sign, but it was a yield sign. And I had second thoughts because I thought if you have a consolidation issue, you have a credit issue. If you have a credit issue, I'm screwed because I wanted to buy another house. The house that I left with my kids and my, my cat was in my name. So I couldn't get another mortgage until that house was sold. And I didn't know how long my ex was going to be in the house. So I knew that eventually I wanted to buy a house. But I'm thinking, well, if I'm staying with this guy, I mean, he's got this consolidation thing on. I'm never going to get a mortgage. So that was the yield sign. But then we get to the Kunamasa in that night and he orders Cavassier, which is so expensive. And I'm looking at him like... Really? Dude, you don't have a dime for this weekend and you're ordering Cavassier? Are you kidding me? And we had gone out when we got up there that afternoon and we had bought all kinds of breakfast stuff and snacks and all. Of course, I paid for everything. So the the amount of money that he's owing me is just, just like ching ching let that cash register ring and I'm thinking like I'm not the Bank of America over here what the hell is going on I mean he had no consideration for what he was spending that weekend and I was paying I was footing the bill I was furious back when we were at his apartment when he was saying that he couldn't go and I said I'm going to lose all this money when do you think you can pay me? He said when he got his income taxes. And I was like, okay. Now, if you ever watch the Judge Mathis show, he will say, don't ever, ever, ever lend somebody money that they promise to pay with the income tax because you will never get it. The true words were never spoken. But I didn't know Judge Mathis at the time. <laughs> he wasn't on the air and I didn't know. And so I, I agreed to it. I mean, what else was I going to do? I show up at this dude's house and... He doesn't have the money. So what am I supposed to do? Just go, no, or go by myself? Yeah, that would have been enjoyable. But I was really taken aback by the Cavassier order. And I was taken aback by some of the things that he put in the cart in the grocery store. Because I was like, dude, this is all my money. You know I have three kids and you're just taking advantage of me. And I didn't say any of that because the weekend was really lovely. If it wasn't for my resentment over the money, it would have been great. So anyway, so now it's January after that Thanksgiving. That Thanksgiving had already happened. So I was pissed off at him to a degree, but you know, I'm thinking I'm going to get my money come income tax time. So now it's February and we're in my apartment and he's in there and he's bitching about the fact that I have the cat. And I'm thinking, how can I be in a relationship with somebody who would have expected me to give up my cat? For him, I would never give up my cat for anybody. I had my cat since my youngest child was one year old. They they grew up together. They're now teenagers together. Why would I do that? 
I didn't say any of this because my head couldn't believe that the gulf was really that wide. But if you looked at it, I knew this guy almost three years at this point. We had started in school when we needed to do prerequisites, when we needed to do the course that I've talked about before, the lifelong learning course. He had been with me for almost three years. We met in June. This was now February. June would be three years. And I didn't know any of this stuff about him. I didn't know that he was the type of guy that would expect me to give up my cat. And I didn't know that he was somebody who would cheapen out on Thanksgiving weekend the way that he did. So these are two things that really have upset me. And I didn't say anything about the cat. And now I'm just waiting on the the money. So sometime, and I've told this story before, sometime in the winter, he brings me to a guitar shop in Boston and he's showing me all these different guitars. And he played, he played bass guitar mostly, but he also played rhythm guitar when he was with certain types of bands. So he's showing me this guitar and I'm like, oh, that's nice. That's nice. I mean, it was really a beautiful, it was a beautiful Les Paul. And, you know, I'm like, oh, this is really nice. You know, ba, 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 ba. And he was really into Gibsons and that was the kind of guitar it was. It was really beautiful. It had like this pearl shine on it. And, and I, we were so long in that guitar store. I swear he was looking for me to buy him that guitar. I swear that was why we spent that much time in it. And I'm standing there and I'm getting the vibe that he wants me to buy him this guitar. And I'm thinking to myself, there is no effing way I'm buying this guy anything until I see my money from Thanksgiving. We're talking hundreds of dollars. So he keeps going back and forth and back and forth with this guitar. I remember walking all over this damn guitar store. And I'm not a musical person. I was completely bored. I was like, Ugh. so anyway, we get to his apartment. Now I'm, I'm thinking to myself very, very, very seriously. This is a guy who expected me to give up my cat for him. And that's stuck in my craw so tightly. And I can't even say anything about it because I'm so upset. I know this is a deal breaker. And I'm trying to stay in this relationship because I want my money. And I will tell you that what I've learned over the years is if you don't have the money to lend, don't. And if you have a moochie boyfriend, get rid of him. Honest. I knew in that guitar shop, Without a doubt, he was looking to get me to pay for that guitar. And I was just like, no. And I'm thinking, I have paid for way too many things because the Thanksgiving thing was something we had agreed on. But there were other nights and I'd be starving when we get out like 10, 11 o'clock at night. I'd be like, I got to get something to eat. So we would go get something to eat and we would get to the end of the meal and he would have like a ribeye steak and oh, I don't have any money, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. One time he came out with me and I think I've told the story before. Sorry if I have. One time he came out with, with me and my friends and we went out to dinner And we get there and he says, I only have $20. And I'm thinking, son of a bitch. He was so passive aggressive. If you only have $20, why are you going out to dinner with me? Because you expect me to pay for it. So I said, well, you better. And this is what I said to him. I said, you better order something that $20 is going to cover. And so we were all having like lobster and shrimp and all kinds of things. And he had a sirloin a little chopped sirloin that costs about fifteen ninety nine, And my friends were like, are you sure that's all you want? You know, we're getting lobster and shrimp and blah, blah, blah. He couldn't. And he was like, no, 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 this is fine. I'm fine. I'm good. And I was like, yeah, you are. Another time I would have said, don't worry about it. Give me the 20 and then order whatever you want and I'll pay for it. But not then. I was bullshit. So he blows me off for biopsy that I was supposed to be having. And then I go over his house and this is now March, the end of March. So then I go over his house and he pulls out from under his bed, the guitar, the the Gibson guitar that was in the shop. And I looked at him and I said, how did you get that guitar? And he said, oh, with my income tax money. So I'm looking at this guitar. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was a Les Paul. I believe it was like limited or classic or something like that, but it cost thousands of dollars. And I was flabbergasted when we were in the guitar store and I had the feeling that he wanted me to pay for it. 
But when he tells me that he bought it with his tax money, I realize I did pay for it. Because even though the guitar was more than he owed me, I knew I wasn't getting my money then. So I never said anything about the cat. But this thing, and I never said anything about the Cavassier, and I never said anything about the money he owed me. But this, when he pulled that guitar out, I was like, it's over. It is over. He had more strikes than he deserved. And I couldn't get a hold of him. And it ghosted me for a few weeks after that after he got his guitar and I had a feeling he was out playing clubs and he was a musician so he could pick up anybody he wanted there was a lot of women flirting with him there was a lot of times I went to his gigs and I would just sit back at the table people would go up to them and talk and blah 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 and so I knew what the score was and he ghosted me and I'm thinking he ghosted me because he owes me money and he's pissed about the cat. And I'm like, this is bullshit. I'm not doing this. And so I call him and I say that I need to go to his place because I had an award dinner to go to at work and I needed my good heels and they were at his house. So what I planned to do was to do a clean sweep and take all my stuff that was at his house, all my makeup, all my shampoo, my robe, my this, my that, and get the hell out of there. So I go swinging down there, dressed to the nines, short skirt, big stiletto heels and I was looking for the dress heels I couldn't wear stilettos to the work thing needed to dress more conservatively but I show up looking like a million dollars and I sweep through I take everything of mine not just that I don't say a word I don't say a word to him I just take everything and I leave and my leg was shaking so much and I talk about when I did my restraining order with my ex-husband that my leg was shaking on the clutch that I was bucking the car This night, I also had my leg shaking and I was bucking the car because I couldn't keep the clutch in. So it was almost the exact same thing. And there was seven years between each of these incidences. But that's how nervous I was the night that I cleaned that out. When I get home, there's there's a message on my answer machine. This is from him. All it says is typical. It was not typical. There was nothing that I did that was typical that night. Typical of what? I realized later that he was talking about typical of women. And I'm thinking, yeah, if you treat all the other women the way you've treated me, yeah, you're probably going to get this reaction time and time again, you moron. Not because there's anything wrong with us, but because there's something wrong with you, jerk. So anyway, I tell you these stories because... I really want you to understand that maybe you've never been in an abusive relationship. Maybe nobody's ever smacked you in the face the way my first husband did when I hit him with the restraining order. Maybe you've never had to testify in front of a grand jury because somebody tried to murder you like I did. I've had to do all this stuff. And even after being in relationships that were that dysfunctional, that bad, that unhealthy, that dangerous, I did enough work to find the most wonderful man in the world who loved me beyond anything I could ever imagine. And you can have that too, especially if you didn't go down as far as I did. But the reason why I brought up that relationship with the guy with the cat, the guy with the pizza, the guy with this, and I have more guys, um, is because I told that guy when I finally walked out, I told him that it was mostly the ghosting and the inability to come to terms with a schedule. And I write about this in Getting Past Your Breakup. The schedule thing was one issue that I write about in Getting Past Your Breakup that didn't seem to be a problem. He just didn't want to do it. That was the bottom line. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to be beholden to a schedule. And that meant he had no respect for my life because I had kids and I had, and they had all kinds of after school activities. I was working, I was going to school, I was doing this, I was doing that. We were both looking for certification for other things, a school adjustment counselor, a few other things. And I wanted to get certified to be an LCSW. So I had all these things on my plate. And I said, I have to know what's going on. I just have to know. And he just wouldn't. He just would not. So according to him and according to me, that's what we broke up over. But these other things were things I'm not bringing up the money. And I'm not bringing up the cat because the gulf is too wide. I don't know what I would have done with those topics had we worked at the schedule, but I might have gone back and revisited them. But when we broke up, I knew 
between the money and the cat thing, we were going sideways. There was no reason for me to discuss the money and the cat because I was with him waiting to see what was going to happen with the money. I really didn't break up with him over the cat. If he didn't owe me money, I probably would have because it was really an unacceptable thing that he would expect me to give up my cat. But there was simply no way that I was going to do that. When I stood up in that courtroom many years before and said that nobody had the right to put their hands on me, it was something that I just had learned. I had to be told at 30 years old, nobody has the right to put their hands on me because I didn't know that. And I thought that all the abuse I had sustained was my fault and it wasn't. But I tell people that after I got the restraining order, it wasn't as if the gates of heaven opened and let me in, but the gates of hell opened and let me out. Being in abusive relationships, being with people that don't appreciate you, being with people who gaslight you, who try to make you crazy, who blame you for things you didn't do, who blame you for things you're not thinking, who are telling you what you're thinking and yelling at you about it. I was just not doing that anymore. And I would get into relationships and I would tell people, whether we were just dating or whether we were in a short-term relationship, whatever we were in, I would say, don't ever tell me what I'm thinking. Don't ever tell me what I'm feeling because that will be a deal breaker. And when I met Michael, I did have to remind him a couple of times, like, don't tell me what, and then he would make a joke out of it because that was Michael. But I continued on after I got that restraining order because I was such a babe in the woods. I was such a pup. I got the restraining order because I was just furious that he would think he had the right to come over my house where he wasn't living. We weren't together. We hadn't been together in over six months. And because I didn't say hello, I get smacked in the face. No, that was ending right there right now. That was not happening. So I continued on with what my therapist was teaching me and what my support groups were teaching me, even my Gestapo Al-Anon people, my ACOA people, my A people, this people, that people. Blah, blah, blah. I was in the women who love too much group and the men who hate women group and, you know, all this, you know, pa, 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 pa. I was just crazy in support groups. It was where I lived. The boys were not with me on the weekends. I went to support group meetings, 12 step meetings, breakfast meetings, lunch meetings, dinner meetings. With All I did was surround myself with support people on the weekends that I didn't have the kids. And I went to classes and I learned new hobbies and I did all kinds of things. The weekends when you don't have your kids is when you build your life. When people complain, oh, it's the weekend, I hate the weekend. Blah, blah, blah. I love the weekend. I was able to go find new things to do and learn and be and blah, blah, blah. Go do it. Sorry for the blah, blah, blah. I went to one time I had a video, I say ba 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 on a video somewhere, and I had the video transcribed, and I must have said ba 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 a few times on the video, because I kept wondering why the transcript kept saying grandpa. I would go, and grandpa, and I would go, what the hell is grandpa? And then I'm like, I don't remember talking about grandpa, and in the sentence, it doesn't make any sense, and then I went back to the video. Every time I went ba ba ba, the, the trans, grandpa, no, not grandpa. It's, Thank you so much for AI, machine intelligence. Not so intelligent. <laughs> doesn't understand ba ba ba. It becomes grandpa. So anyway, grandpa, um, I learned so much. I tell people all the time, go to places where recovery happens. Go to places where you can build your life. I used to go to these little hobby shops. There was one near me I can't remember the name of it It wasn't it wasn't a big chain like Michael's or hobby shop it was a an independent I really like to patronize independent places so if there's a Home Depot next to a little hardware store I'm going to go to the little hardware store yes I know I'm going to spend more money but I'm going to go to the hardware store if they don't have what I have then I'll go get that at Home Depot but I really believe in mom and pop pharmacies mom and pop hardwares mom and pop hobby shops to go to this place and I did such great classes there and I buy all these things and I would do all these buy books on how to do arranged silk flower arrangements and then I would go to the hobby shop and I get all these silk flowers and it was wonderful I would go to yard sales and I would look for old teapots and old depression glass and things like that to put depression glass vases to put silk flower arrangements in. I had a ball. I mean, would ripple out to something else. You've got to go to meet up. You've got to go to community things. You've got to fear if you belong to a church, figure out what your church is doing, figure out what your community is doing, go to your town hall, look on the bulletin board. There are still people that attach things physically, manually to bulletin boards. Most cable TVs have a local channel where you could just turn on the TV to the local channel and find that out. Go places, figure it out, figure out hobbies, figure out recovery groups, figure out support groups. Go do it. Get a therapist. 
do a GPYB boot camp. We have a codependency boot camp coming up. The first week of April is going to start. If you want to be in that boot camp, even if you've not done any GPYB work, I will do GPYB work with those in the boot camp that need to do that. But those who are a little bit beyond that and want to do strictly codependency work will do that. Please sign up. I don't have the registration form yet, but please send email to Susan at gettingpastyourbreakup.com if you want to be part of the April, first week of April, 2019 codependency boot camp. I don't have the registration form out, but first come, first serve. And the last few ones that I offered oversold. So please let me know. And again, first come, first serve. If you ask me for a registration form, I'm going to give it. So. Anyway, people who do the boot camps will say, my God, this changed my life. And I want you to know that everything that's designed in the boot camps is work that I have done in my life. Think about where I was. Think about where I came from. And if I can do it, you can do it. And the reason why I put all these examples of me into my podcast It's because I want you to see that not only was I voiceless in the beginning, but just because I couldn't shove somebody's crap out on the lawn and get them arrested or whatever, I didn't know how to end a relationship. And I couldn't throw the pizza guy's crap out on the lawn because it was his apartment. I didn't live there. I didn't even live in Chicago. I lived lived in Rhode Island. Can't go to Chicago and go to jail. Nobody's going to be able to bail me out. So I didn't know how to end the relationship, but I ended it. And I want you to think about that. Somebody who couldn't find the words to end that goofy relationship. But years later, I'm putting down all these militant standards. I'm telling Michael, a wonderful, wonderful guy, don't you dare tell me how I'm feeling. Don't you dare tell me what I'm thinking. That's not going to happen. Call me one name ever and I'm gone. And I told that to every single guy I ever dated from that guy in the beginning, the pizza guy to the end. You call me one name and I am gone and there will be no excuses and there will be no anything. I don't know why people don't believe me. People like to test. Oh, did she really mean it when she said that? Yes, I really meant it when I said that. Okay. And I've had clients who have tried to push me on that. If you keep doing this. If you keep going back to Mr. Banana Head and wiping out all all the work that we've done, I need to move you along and put somebody who really wants to do the work in your place because I keep my client list very, very low because I give my clients a lot of time and attention. And then people will push me anyway. And they'll be like, oh, she probably didn't really mean it. Yeah, I really want to see my ex tonight. Easier to get forgiveness than to get permission. That's why a lot of people run on that because it usually is. But not with me. You're not going to get permission. You're not going to get forgiveness after a certain time. Think about that. One of the reasons I left my first marriage was because I had three sons and I didn't want them talking to women the way my ex had talked to me. He'd call me every name in the book and he would string them all together. They were worse that like I, I've never said in my life, I wouldn't repeat in my life. And they were awful, awful, horrible, misogynistic names. And you could think about what those are. And I did not want my sons to grow up and talk to women like that. And so I told every guy, I only introduced my my kids to like two or three guys, but I told every one of them, do not ever call me a name. And that was because I didn't want my kids to hear that. And my kids never heard that. And to this day, no one has ever called me a name. Even guys, when we're breaking up, when we're angry at each other, even then, even when I'm leaving anyway, it doesn't matter what they call me. It doesn't matter what they say to me. And they didn't call me the names then. If you have standards and you look somebody in the eye and you say, look, this is not flying with me, you will get a respectful thing back if the person is healthy. Even in our breakups, guys did not call me names because they were the type of people that were respectful enough to know that would be a low blow at this point. I've had people, I had a woman last year who just decided that she was going to be dating, she was going to be doing this, she was going to be doing that, and she decided to call me the B word because she knew how much I hated it. Well, that's somebody who's not healthy, somebody who's very toxic, and even the guys that I was with that were a little off, a little bit of a banana head, a lot of banana head, they still didn't call me a name. You can do this. It will happen to you. I want you to get out your phone, your computer, a pen, a pad, whatever it is that help you remember things. I want you to think about your story. How would you handle this situation? How would you handle that situation? How would you handle the pizza situation? How would you handle the money situation? How would you handle the cat situation? Do you have anything that you can analogize close to it? What would you do? What do you need to get 
from where you are to where you want to be. When I was dating commitment phobes, the biggest revelation I had was that I was a commitment phobe. And my counselor kept trying to tell me that. My therapist kept trying to tell me that. And I just didn't believe her. So after my like umpteenth commitment phobe, and especially when you've been with abusers, the commitment phobes are not that bad. You know, it was like, these are, these are pretty good. It's like they were mostly cute, funny guys that I was having a good time with. And I said to my therapist, I'm having fun. And I'm not a commitment phobe. I'm available to these relationships. And she would go, nope, 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 you're not. And I would look at her in the eye and I go, yes, I am. I am not afraid of commitment. I'm just having fun with these guys. And if they're afraid of commitment, okay, that's fine. My ex toddles off into the sunset with somebody else. And she says to me, do you think they're happy? I don't know. She goes, they're not. And I was like, okay. And she said, and even if they are, who cares? And that's where it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter come from. Because she said to me, who cares if they're happy or not? It's nothing to do with you. It's none of your business. And I was like, oh, You don't like hearing that, but it's the truth. It doesn't matter if your ex is happy or not. It's none of your business. So one day I go into my therapist's office and she says, how's your fear of intimacy going? And it struck me like she hit me in the face with a cold fish. I was like, oh my God, the color must have drained from my face because she said the right words. Fear of commitment didn't do it for me. And when you get the the new affirmation material, you'll see that I put a lot of different words in and I'll say, if this word doesn't go do it for you, try this word. If this word doesn't do it for you, try that word. She said fear of intimacy instead of fear of commitment. And it went bingo. That's what I have. I knew it. I knew it in my gut. That's what I had. And then I had to work on it. I had to work on my father's stuff because that's where it was coming from. I didn't want to work on it because he had passed away and I really liked my father, but I had to dig into it. So anyway, anyway, there was another guy that I was seeing and I really liked him and he was really cute. We didn't decide on a committed relationship yet, but we had kind of hung around together for a while. Then we started dating each other. We went on official dates. He spent money on me, but I would drive because he didn't have a car. He had wrecked his car. So I would drive. I had this sweet little midnight blue Toyota Celica that was brand new, brand new off the lot. And he would say, bring your car over, bring your car over. And I would bring my car over and he would wash it by hand and and wax it and it looked gorgeous. And then we would go cruising in my gorgeous little Toyota Celica and then we'd make out like crazy people. So after a few weeks, he's like, you know, what are we going to do here? I really want to sleep with you and go through testing. And he was like, what do you mean we have to get through testing? Like you were married a long time and you got divorced and I was married a long time and I got divorced. I haven't really been with anybody. You haven't really been with anybody. Why do we have to go get tested? And I had been with the guy in Chicago. I mean, God knows about him. So I wanted to get tested. I said, when I became single, I made a commitment to myself that I was going to get tested. And so I also made a commitment to myself that I'm not going to go out with anybody who doesn't get tested. And he was pushing back. He didn't, he didn't really want to do it. That was a split. That was a communication. Nope. We're not doing it. So a couple of weeks from that, I'm out with friends. We had mutual friends and he shows up and he's got this blonde woman with him. And he's a small guy. He's like five foot six, but I'm like five foot one. So we work together. This woman is like five foot ten and she outweighs him by like 50 pounds. So everybody is snickering and they're pointing at me. And I'm like, I see it. I see it. I see it. No, no needs. Keep pointing it out to me. It was a little uncomfortable, but I was like, you know what, dude, if... You're going to be a brat because I don't want to sleep with you right now. And then you've got to go find King Kong over there. That's fine. But this is part of the GPYB series about standards and compatibility. If you have a standard, I'm not sleeping with you until we're STD tested. And the person goes, well, that's stupid. I mean, he kind of had a point. He hadn't been with anybody since his divorce. And he had been divorced for a while and I had been divorced for a while, but I do, I was with the guy in Chicago. And if something happened in this relationship, we had slept together and I did get a venereal disease. So I want to know, did I get it from him or did I get it from the guy in Chicago? What, where did I get, the hell did I get it from? I wanted to know. And he just didn't want to do it. And I really liked him. I mean, we used to make out like crazy people. It was so sensual. He was so cute and he was funny and I liked him. But there was just no way I was going to be pressured into sleeping with him before STD testing. And he just objected and that was it. There was nothing else. The it was only accepting that I could do is to go back on the testing and I just wouldn't and I knew that that's what it would take to stay with this guy to go back on the testing and sleep with him and I wasn't ready emotionally 
and I wasn't ready physically. And that's just the way that it was. Anyway, you have to develop these standards. And there is no secret to this stuff. I tell you guys all the time exactly what I do and how I do it. It's not hard. You have to have your standards. You have to know what you're doing. I have a friend who teaches Sunday school and she would tell me, well, you're this and you're that and you're, you know, you're tough and you set boundaries and you're from the Bronx and, blah, 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 and you've got that little attitude going. And I said, no, 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 sweetheart. You can do it. She goes, I can't do it. And she teaches Sunday school. I said, what do you teach in Sunday school? What do you teach the kids? What do you tell the kids? She goes, we do parables. I said, that's right. And who teaches the parables? She's like, Jesus. I'm like, right. So think of GPYB as a parable, a giant parable. If I could do it, you could do it. Stop thinking, well, you know, Jesus did it. I said, do you ever sit there and say, blessed are those who we And do you ever go, well, you know, that's good for Jesus, not good for me because he's Jesus. No, you don't, you don't sit there and say, okay, well, Jesus did that. If Jesus was kind and sweet to everybody. I don't have to be kind and sweet to everybody. I'm like, no, you teach the children the parables. Jesus taught the parables. Just because Jesus said it doesn't mean you can't do it. So I said, just because I said it doesn't mean you can't do it. I'm not saying that I'm Jesus, but I'm just saying. I understand a lot of my standards aren't usual. I know that I work and, and I have certain standards in my life based on things that happen to me. But you can still analogize to it. You can still look at it and you can still say, okay, that's similar to what I did. My friends told me my standards were too high. They could not believe that I would tell a guy, use the word bitch around me and we're over. They couldn't believe I said that to guys, but I said it to every single guy I dated. And I was only in a couple of serious relationships between my first marriage and Michael, but even the guys that I dated, no one ever called me a bitch. I didn't get called a bitch until a few months ago when somebody that I was working with, she went back to her banana head and she called me a bitch because I said something. Or she, and she only said it because she knew I didn't like it. And, and I said, you know what? At least I'm not you. And when I said at least I'm not you, it's like somebody being that vindictive. So anyway... Nobody ever called me a bitch. So my friends were just going for the low hanging fruit. Well, I wanted people who would respect that. I don't care if you understand that. I don't care. Just, just know that's my standard. And if you can't meet it, that's fine. We'll go our separate ways, but have your standards, commit to your standards and know what they are. And again, I had standards that I had to know which ones were negotiable. And for what? I didn't think that my needs to be neat and clean was going to be negotiable. I didn't think it was. I was sick of slobby guys. I was sick of picking up after people. I was sick of people who couldn't dust or make a bed or do things like that or clean a toilet. I was just sick of that. But when Michael came along, he was the biggest slob in the world, but everything on the positives was so overwhelming. And I wasn't going to clean up after him either. If he had bucked me on getting a cleaning person, that would have been the end of that. But he didn't. And we had a really nice relationship for a long time. And I even had to make compromises with that. When I would ask him to get his laundry off the pool table and he'd shove it in a hamper and then shove it in a closet. That's not where I wanted. I wanted it upstairs, folded and in the in the drawer. But I went, you know what? I'm choosing my battles and I'm not going to get on his case about this. And when he got sick, there was a hamper full of clothes in the closet downstairs, in the coat closet downstairs. I never moved that. I didn't move that until months after he passed, over a year later. It was so... You have to know what standards are negotiable and what are non-negotiable. Getting rid of my cat, not negotiable. Absolutely not negotiable. Nope, dude, you get rid of first. Owe me a lot of money or needs a lot of money. Nope. Standard, set in stone, not going to happen. Not going to happen. You're not going to get that kind of money from me. Being a cheap bastard, no. Nope, you can't. Uh, bucking me on the STD testing, nope. Nope, nope. Nope. There is absolutely no getting around that. So anyway, I want you to think about things. I want you to think about things in your previous relationships. What's a go? What's a no go? What's negotiable? What may be negotiable? And again, I didn't know that the house thing could have been negotiable, but I couldn't have caved on it completely. I couldn't have caved to, yes, it's fine if you're a slob and I'll clean up after you. There had to be, I had to come off of my non-negotiable that you have to be neat and clean because Michael wasn't, but I had to put something in its place because it was still cleaning up after you is still a non-negotiable. I'm not doing it. So we had to come to a compromise and we did. And that was awesome. 
So think about things like that and think about how and when you can compromise and when you absolutely can't and be true to yourself and don't get to a place where gee I really like this person he's really everything I want but I'll take this really important thing that I that means a lot to me and I'll just throw it out the window don't do that it has to be more than everything I want because Michael was everything I want but he was so much more than that he was things I never dreamed never in a million years that I dream of somebody who is who would be as wonderful as he was to me and to my kids and to everything. He was just so wonderful. So of course we compromised on the housekeeping thing, but only because he was so, so, so beyond anything I could have imagined in so many other ways. So think about it. Think about it. And don't capitulate on something that's really, really important to you. Okay, guys, I hope that's helpful. There's going to be more of this. Dating. I'll talk to you guys later.